We are settled. Then a very good afternoon to all of you. We are going to start our next session. Uh, our so very beloved president, uh, Dr. T. Mahapatraji, who is also the Honorable DGIC, Secretary there, as you all know. Uh, we have uh, our guest today, who has come all the way from Bangalore to deliver the Foundation Day Lecture, Professor and Padma Bhushan. Balaramji, Dr. P. Balaramji. Uh, we have so many you know, senior personalities with us, right from Dr. R.B. Singh to our uh, DG, Sahab, former DG, Dr. Punjab Singh, and many of you. I, I'll, I'll come to that a little later. Uh, and all the fellows. Uh, well, I think after having a scintillating session uh, in the morning, uh, we had, a, you know, a very good AGM. After that, we are here right now to listen to the Foundation Day Lecture to be given by none other than Padma Bhushan P. Balaramanji uh, on behalf of the Academy, as well as on my own behalf. I would like to welcome him heartily to uh, the Foundation Day Lecture Session. At this point of time, I would also request our president to kindly offer him a bouquet. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and being here today to share your thoughts. Uh, I welcome our Honorable President, Dr. Sri Mahabhatraji, uh, whom you have heard in the morning how, how vast experience and expertise he has. He has been guiding the academy so very well, right from the front, and under his guidance, we are all moving forward. I feel with his uh, direction, with his involvement, the academy will go to the next level. I welcome you, sir, uh, from the academy. Uh, I also welcome all my colleagues uh, sitting on the dais, the Vice President, uh, Dr. Iket Singhji, uh, Dr. Josi, the Secretary, and Dr. Bansal, another Secretary, and all our, uh, uh, the editors, two editors we have, and then the financial person, uh, all, of the, all of the persons in our uh, Academy Secretariat here in Delhi, uh, sir, I, I would also like very heartily, I like to very heartily welcome uh, Dr. Punjab Singh, uh, who is a former DG, <coughs> Secretary there, past president of uh, the Academy. Uh, I'm so very grateful, sir, that you made it. You always are there with us. In every EC, we see you. We have your inputs. We welcome you, uh, sir, to this session. We have yet another, my guru, my Boss, Dr. Aram Acharyaji. I have seen him after a long time. Uh, he has come. <coughs> uh, welcome to you, sir, very much. And we are so very happy that you made it to this particular session. Uh, we have our past <coughs> uh, president. Uh, our, we have R.B. Singh Sahab, the senior most person. Uh, we all depend on his insight, his inputs, his guidance. Thank you, sir. Kirti Singh, sir. Yeah, uh, so very uh, luminary, a great horticulturist. Uh, we'll, we welcome you, sir. Uh, Katiyal Sahab. Uh, then we have our Dr. Puri Ji, Dr. P.L. Gautam Sahab, Dr. M.L. Madan Sahab, the Parmasri Awardee, uh, and uh, Dr. A.K. Mukhopadhyay Sahab, who has also made it a point to attend this particular uh, session. And so many other people. We have the respected deputy DGs. We have the vice chancellors, honorable visits uh, coming here. We have the directors from National Institute, other ICR institutes. We have the newly elected fellows and uh, the associates, the awardees, uh, and also the, uh, our secretariat staff. On behalf of the academy, I welcome all of you to this uh, a very, I think, exciting session. We are going to have definitely the food for thoughts and also for action from uh, uh, Professor Balramanji 
we look forward to his uh, delivery. Uh, with this word, on behalf of the Academy, once again, of course, Dr. Lakraji, I forgot. I might have forgotten the name of so many others. Kindly excuse me. I, I welcome all of you because the, uh, our, our main speaker has to leave by 4 o'clock. So therefore, 4.30, he has to leave. So I think the floor, we can give it to him with the permission of our president. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bajal Barwa. Uh, on behalf of the Academy, on my own personal behalf, I would also like to add my own words of uh, very warm welcome to our President, uh, Dr. Mahapatra, for uh, agreeing to chair this session, and our chief guest, uh, Dr. Pibal Ram, uh, from former Director Indians of uh, uh, Science Bangalore, to our very honored past presidents, Professor Abhi Singh, Professor Punjab Singh, Vice Presidents, Dr. Katyal, uh, former Vice President Dr. P. L. Gautam is here, uh, former Secretary Dr. T. T. Singh, and Dr. Bajarua, Dr. Joshi, Dr. Bansal, a lot of IC, very senior officials from ICR, Vice Chancellor of many universities. Uh, though <clears throat> I have a very uh, the privilege of introducing the uh, chief guest today's speaker, though I'm quite sure most of you must be familiar. <clears throat> with Professor B. Balram, uh, but I still feel that it's one of the, uh, one of the very good traditions that we introduce a speaker, uh, for particularly for an occasion like this. Today is the foundation day of the Academy, and as you all know, it was founded on the World Environment Day. Today, in fact, we have, it is the 50th celebration of, uh, they have completed 50 years of the celebrations of the World Environment Day and with the theme is only one earth. So this is very important that uh, uh, we have to realize that it's the only place where we have to live. And uh, living sustainably in harmony with nature, that is the focus area of this particular World Environment Day. So I think uh, <clears throat> it's a very appropriate that we have a uh, speaker of Dr. Uh, Professor Bibal Ram Stecher. Just to give you a brief uh, introduction, Dr. Balram actually graduated in, from Pune University in chemistry, then uh, went on to do his uh, uh, master's from the Institute of Technology, and then his PhD from the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. He was a postdoctoral uh, fellow at the Department of Chemistry in the Harvard University in the USA. He joined the Indian Institute of Science as a lecturer way back in 1973, and starting from that point, he finally retired as director in social science, holding all the positions in between the lecturer and the... Now it's possible? Okay. Now it's better? Uh, is it audible now? Which part? You missed all of it? Huh? Okay. Uh, I'll just start at uh, Professor P. Balram. He uh, started his career at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, as a lecturer in 1973, and went through all these steps and finally retired as director of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And uh, <clears throat> uh, his uh, work is, is very well known for his work on the uh, general area of design and synthesis of model peptides, particularly disulfides. And these studies have provided a means for developing bioorganic models for redox potentials, proteins containing active disulfide loops. His contribution in the area of biological membranes and in developing fluorescent probe methodology for examining membrane structures are highly significant. And uh, uh, this aspect was ex uh, exemplified by his work in establishing regional differentiation of sperm plasma membranes. And in his uh, most recent work, he, was, he has demonstrated the use of disulfide cross-linking as a means of thermally stabilizing multimeric proteins using uh, thiamide rate synthesis as a model. He has more than 400 publications, and uh, <clears throat> uh, most of you must be familiar who read Current Science that his uh, uh, editorial, his editorials in Current Science 
uh, are always one uh, one which you should read in case you don't. They are really worth, uh, in fact, multiple readings if you go through that. Uh, he has been, of course, uh, uh, on the editorial board membership of uh, Chem, Chem Biochem, Biopolymers, Protein Engine Design and Section, uh, and of course on many, many journals. <coughs> Uh, he was, uh, just to mention a few of his awards, he has got the S.S. Bhatnagar Award way back in 1986. Uh, he is also the, uh, the World Academy of Sciences in 19, uh, 1994. Uh, he is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and, the Academy of, and also he has got the G.D. Birla Award in 1994. And uh, to top it all, uh, in 2014, he was recognized by the government of India by, award, by awarding Padma Bhushan. So we have a very illustrious scientist uh, with us today, and uh, <clears throat> he's going to talk on uh, reflections on science in the age of the coronavirus. So with these few words, I would like to now request Professor Balram uh, to deliver the uh, foundation lecture. Thank you very much for that introduction. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be with you at your annual meeting. And uh, I must confess at the beginning that I am very far from the science of agriculture. I was trained as a chemist and uh, eventually drifted into biology. And over a period of many years, I've also been interested in other branches of science when I was the editor of Current Science for a very long time, between 1995 and 2013. Over the last two years, uh, we've had the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's been caused by the coronavirus. And for the first time, I think biology has come right to the forefront. Everybody knows the term coronavirus. So this is, of course, an appropriate time to reflect on science in general, and therefore I've titled my presentation as Reflections on Science in the Age of the Coronavirus. What I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about chemicals in nature, and then give you an abridged history of the coronavirus. Here and there I will digress a little bit into biology and chemistry, which all of you will be familiar with, and right towards the end, I will talk a little bit on the evolutionary history of the coronavirus during the pandemic. Because we are all concerned with, with the problem of whether there will be another new variant or what will happen to the virus in the years to come. Now very often, if you tell the general public that you're a scientist, they ask you, what is science? And when they ask you what is science, the only answer that you can give them is that science is the study of nature. Then, of course, you might have a second question asked, a supplementary, which is what is nature? And the best definition of nature that I have found is in the editorial which appeared in the very first issue of the journal Nature. The journal had just started and they commissioned Thomas Huxley, the famous biologist, to write the editorial. Huxley did not write the editorial. Instead, what he did was he translated from the German an essay written by the German poet von Goethe. And I quote, what Goethe said was this, nature, we are surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her and powerless to penetrate beyond her. Over the last two years, what we have witnessed is really the force of nature. So we can observe nature. That's what we do when we practice science. But when we observe nature, our ways of doing science are determined by the tools that we have available. Two disciplines, microbiology and cosmology, both emerged in the 17th century. They emerged when Galileo pointed the telescope towards the sky and then observed that there was 
a universe well beyond what we see on earth. Galileo at that time and his contemporaries were limited by the power of human vision. Leeuwenhoek in the Netherlands put tap water under the microscope that he'd invented and he saw these little creatures wiggling around in the water. You can't see them otherwise, bacteria. And therefore two fields of science, microbiology and cosmology, were driven really by the technologies of those times, the invention of the microscope on the one hand, the telescope on the other. The theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson many years ago said that science is often driven by new technology than by new concepts. And I'm sure this is true in agriculture. After all, today when you talk of genetically modified crops, the technologies that you're talking are the biotechnologies which have been the fruit of the revolution in molecular biology. But when we think of nature, we think of plants, we think of animals, and of course plants produce an enormous number of chemicals. I illustrate only two of them here. As a chemist, I like the structures of caffeine, I like the structure of morphine, and then, of course, the plants are beautiful to look at. Now, of course, you might ask the question, why do plants make these complex molecules? What, is it of any use to the plant to make these molecules? When chemists look at the molecules made by plants, we call it the chemistry of natural products. So if we revisit the chemistry of natural products and ask, what do microorganisms make? What do plants make? What do animals make? We then come to biochemistry, the study of primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. Everything produced by a plant, which we talk about, caffeine or morphine or so many other molecules, is called a secondary metabolite. But it's only slowly that you realize that there's nothing secondary about secondary metabolism. In fact, secondary metabolism has been defined, wonderful uh, description, saying that it represents the splendid idiosyncratic diversity of nature endowing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. So every biological organism produces these molecules and it is only through chemistry that organisms communicate with one another. We are the only exception who communicate entirely by means of complex language and sound. When you talk about biopesticides, for example, what you're really talking about is how to influence uh, the action of pests on plants, for instance, by controlling them with another biological organism or an extract from the biological organism. This leads to many fundamental questions. How many chemicals are produced in nature? That is chemical space. How many living organisms are there in nature? That is biological space. We talk about conserving biodiversity. Have we catalogued biodiversity in its entirety? How are these chemicals synthesized? How do all these organisms make these chemicals? They need genes, they need enzymes. Why are these chemicals necessary for the organism? That's the biological imperative. How are the chemicals of one organism recognized by another? How does the pollinator get to the flower? This requires proteins. These are receptor proteins. So there's the vast enterprise of biology, biological chemistry, what is called chemical biology, which is needed to answer these questions. But I show you only one familiar object. That's the chili. And then you can see that the active principle of the chili, the one that gives it its spicy taste, is capsaicin. I've pictured the molecule as the chemist would write it. But then you ask, how are these molecules made? You see the schemes which are on the left-hand side of the slide. You can see that beginning with the simple amino acids, phenylalanine and valine, through a complex set of chemical transformations, eventually the capsaicin molecule is put together in the plant. This is the process of biosynthesis. If I was an organic chemist, I would simply look at the structures which are there and be fascinated by them. But if, if I was in a biochemistry department, I would look at what is written against the arrow, the enzymes which catalyze each one of these chemical reactions. 
But now you realize one thing, that for every molecule which is made in nature, there's a complex biosynthetic pathway, which requires enzymes. And since enzymes are proteins, you then require genes. And therefore, if I simplify on this slide, if you want to go from substrate to product, you need an enzyme, and if you need an enzyme, you need a gene. But if you need a series of chemical reactions, one after the other, lined up, you need a whole set of genes, one after the other, arranged in modular fashion, which have to be turned on and off at the same time, depending upon when the metabolite has to be produced. So for a multi-step pathway, you need clusters of genes, you need operons, you need modular assembly. As an outsider to this field, when I began to read this many years ago, I realized that if I spoke, I would never be taken seriously by those who had been trained in biology or biochemistry. So I went back to the literature and found that I could now quote Francis Crick. Francis Crick said long time ago, as early as 1958, in a remarkable paper which appeared in the Society of Ex for Experimental Biology, in which almost everything that you talk about in today's biotechnology has been anticipated at some point or the other. He says the main function of proteins is to act as enzymes. And then he says, it is at first sight paradoxical that it is probably easier for an organism to produce a new protein than to produce a new small molecule. So the plant invests an enormous amount of effort in making caffeine or morphine. And it's an enormous amount of genetic and metabolic energy which goes into this process. Now I'll come to the subject of my presentation, really. We live in the age of the coronavirus. And in March of 2020, when the first lockdown was announced, we were all shut up immediately. Now, I've never been shut up before and uh, locked in the house, unable to go out. The only thing that you can do is to read on the computer. So I turned to the internet to ask myself a few questions about what is the coronavirus all about. But you can see that the coronavirus by April of 2020, all these pictures are taken in April of 2020 from the newspapers, had captured the public imagination. Policemen in Secunderabad were riding around on horses with that headgear. Auto rickshaw drivers in Chennai had decorated their auto rickshaws with the spikes of the coronavirus. In the center is the picture put out by the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. Spherical, spiky projections on the surface. And chefs in Italy and in France, which bore the brunt of the first wave of the coronavirus in April, May of 2020, they had in fact still retained their sense of humor and they were making Easter eggs and Corona cake in Italy, despite the casualty rates. The human burden of the coronavirus has been staggering. This is an old slide. I didn't bother to make it again because there is so much of political discussion worldwide on how many casualties there have been. All it is sufficient to realize that the casualties have been there in millions. Yesterday evening, I had the opportunity to make a very brief presentation before a discussion on the coronavirus at the India International Center. There, of course, I heard a great deal of self-congratulation on how well we've tackled the coronavirus. I was constrained then to remind everybody that in 1918, in the influenza pandemic of 1918, it lasted for three years. A hundred years later, the COVID-19 pandemic has also lasted three years. All the century of progress in science has not been able to stem the advance of biology. What is a virus? The best definition of a virus that I found is in this book, which is subtitled A Philosophical Dictionary of Biology. The title of the book is From Aristotle to Zeus, and it's written by the English immunologist Peter Medeva, who says that a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. It is, because that's what it is. The genetic material is wrapped up inside the virus, but the outside of the virus is a spiky projection, the spike protein that you see. 
The genetic material, of course, gives all the instructions for the virus to replicate itself in the human host. There's also a phospholipid bilayer. This phospholipid bilayer is obtained, it's an enveloped virus. It gets it from our cells. So when I was infected with the coronavirus, by that time I'd learned all of this, and I felt rather bad that here was the virus now taking pieces of lipid out of me and putting it together to make more viruses and uh, reproducing itself. We've been advised to wash our hands with soap and water and to use alcohol-based uh, sanitizers, and we've done that religiously for over two years. Over a century ago, one of the founding fathers of modern medicine, William Osler, said that soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectants. This was true even before the age of the coronavirus. While soap and water has been in abundance during over the last two years, common sense sometimes has been missing. Why should we learn about the coronavirus? The best advice comes from a master strategist. This is Michael Corleone in Godfather II, a movie. And he says, keep your friends close but your enemy is closer. So if we've declared the coronavirus as an enemy, we must worry about the coronavirus. Now, of course, in March of 2020, like all of you, I also heard the Prime Minister's address. The coronavirus was a declared enemy, and we were going to overcome it in exactly 18 days or 21 days. A little bit longer than it took, I think, for the entire Mahabharata war to be completed. So at that time, I began to read about the coronavirus. I asked myself only one question. When did the coronavirus enter the scientific literature? So we can search the internet and find out. Now, I did write the results of my findings in a popular magazine, Frontline. And what I really did in the course of this investigation, which is my research during the first phase of the pandemic, is to find the discoverer of the coronavirus, who is the lady whose picture, whose picture I show you here. And of course, the article that I wrote in Frontline uh, generally did not attract very much attention here, but it was in fact picked up and reproduced in a newsletter in a very small town in Colorado called Ure, Colorado, and it was in their newsletter called The Historian. This is because the discoverer of the coronavirus eventually settled in the small town in Ure, Colorado, and she died there. So they were very happy to find that they had a famous scientist who had lived among themselves. But she was not a famous scientist. I was interviewed then by archivists in the United States, and I told them this. I said it is a tribute to the power of the internet that the road from Ure in Colorado to Flagstaff in Arizona passes through Bangalore. It seems to me that in some strange way, the virus has led us to its discovery, discoverer turning the world upside down. So you go back into the literature. By this time in April of 2020, this picture, this electron micrograph that I show you was known. And the picture of the lady on the right was also known. It was there even in the newspapers. June Almeida, the electron microscopist who took the first electron micrograph of the virus. On the left is the picture of David Tyrrell, virologist working for many years on a virus which causes the common cold, the rhinovirus, and was looking for a cold vaccine at that time. He was the most prominent virologist in England for, for a while. Now it turns out that if you read a paper carefully, especially an old paper, you will find all the details in the paper, unlike papers today, where much of it is in supplementary material. Now I ask the question, those pictures which are there are of the first coronavirus, where did that sample come from? And then he says, for example, you will see in the legend to the figure 229E, that's the abbreviation used. And then if you go back and look, you will find that 229E is the strain of somebody called Hambre and Prochno in 1966. And then I read further, and down in the acknowledgments I found 
Dr. D. Hamre was acknowledged for the 229E virus. So the virus had come from somewhere, and a new technique of electron microscopy had been used to characterize it. Those spikes were found, and the coronavirus was born because it looked like the sun's corona. So I went back to the 1966 paper. This says a new virus isolated from the human respiratory tract, and this was by Dorothy Hamre. And though I now realized that it was a lady who had found the first coronavirus, and I looked at her paper. Her paper was remarkable. It demonstrated that it was an RNA virus. It actually used classical methods of filtration to find its dimensions, 89 millimicrons or 89 nanometers in today's technology. So this was a remarkable paper, according to me. And in 2018, a year before the coronavirus pandemic, I found this paper as a case report which said that there was a case of acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is what we call what we get now, in a healthy adult due to 229E. So this coronavirus was also capable of causing acute respiratory distress. So I realized then that Dorothy Hambre was a lady who had discovered the coronavirus. And uh, since I do like to give presentations to students and so on and bring in a little bit of history, I wanted to get a picture of Dorothy Hambre. So I went to Google. And today, of course, all research, no research can be done without Google. You can go from Google, you can go to Google Scholar, you can go to PubMed and everywhere. And I searched and I found that I was able to build a little biographical note on Dorothy Hambre. Uh, I realized that she was a scientist, begun in bacteriology, transited to virology in the period between 1939 and maybe early 1950s, before she went to the University of Chicago. In this period, she'd done a lot of very good work, first on penicillin and later on on uh, viruses. And yet, I could not find a picture of her on the internet. And so I began to search for a picture of her on the internet. You might ask, why do I search for a picture of her on the internet? If I look around this audience, you will find the answer. I think I can count not more than three, four, or possibly five ladies in this audience. And today, of course, we talk a great deal about women in science. And so to me, it seemed, in America, there were very few women in science in the period of the Great Depression and in the events which led to the Second World War. So here was this lady who'd done all this remarkable work, so we must get a picture of her. And that was my research during the first lockdown. And I eventually traced a reference to her in an archive in Arizona where some papers had been deposited. So I wrote to the archivist, and this email was written on the 29th of April, 2020. I got an immediate response. They said they were also under lockdown, but they were very interested. And eventually I found her picture, and there it is. These are the three discoverers of the coronavirus. Today, if you were to give a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the coronavirus, these are the three people you must give it to. Except that in all the classical textbooks of virology, the coronavirus has been consigned uh, to a footnote. And the reason for it is this review article which appeared in 1996 by David Tyrrell. Tyrrell, at the end of a long career working on viruses, concluded that coronaviruses cause acute, mild, upper respiratory infection, common cold. And once he said this, the interest in coronaviruses died completely. In 2002-2003, the first outbreak of the coronavirus happened, SARS-CoV-1. And when SARS-CoV-1 came from southern China, it was first noticed in Hanoi, and the Vietnamese government asked the WHO for help, and the WHO at that time did something wonderful. Instead of having a meeting, they immediately dispatched a physician and an outstanding physician to the site, Carlo Urbani. He realized that it was a new infectious disease, extremely infectious, a lot of fatalities already had happened, and therefore he persuaded the Vietnamese government to impose the most extraordinary measures, and they contained it. 
But of course, Urbani himself contracted the disease and died within a few days. February 28th was the request for help. March 9th was the quarantine. March 11th, Urbani had symptoms. March 29th, he was dead. This was the year 2003. We didn't worry about this because it didn't come here. You see, we have always believed that national boundaries are sacrosanct. But what we must remember is that for biology, no national boundary is sacrosanct. I'll digress a little bit into chemistry because what I have to say about mutations might require a little bit of chemistry. And I think for an audience of agricultural scientists, I need not remind you that chemistry is important. Soil chemistry, after all, is critical to the health of agriculture. But the biochemist Arthur Kornberg, many years ago, wonderfully said this. He said, chemistry is the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. In fact, I might extend this to say that chemistry should be the lingua franca of the medical, biological, agricultural, and in fact, of all sciences. The only way chemistry and biology differ is in their length scales, their time scales, and sometimes in their energy scales. Uh, the sizes of the collections of molecules that you deal with simply differ. There you can see the virus positioned between the ribosome, which makes proteins in your cell, and the mitochondrion, which produces the ATP for energy. That's about the size of a virus. This cartoon summarizes the importance of chemistry. There is this man doing a crossword puzzle. He asks, what's a nine-letter word for biotechnology? The lady sitting next to him is very smart. She immediately says chemistry. I might change this cartoon to say, what is a nine-letter word for material science, which is the basis of nanotechnology today? And the answer would once again be chemistry. Now, sometimes chemistry, people don't like it because it deals with structures. It's just the way you don't like mathematics because it deals with symbols and equations. So in order to learn chemistry or mathematics, you need to le learn a language first before you learn the subject. And that's a little bit of a barrier. The foundational pillars of chemistry are Mendeleev's periodic table, tells you diversity, Wohler synthesis of urea from ammonium cyanate, which I'll show you on the next slide, tells you about the unity of chemistry. Boltzmann, a physicist who introduced the idea of dynamics, and all Boltzmann was studying was heat. And then he asked, what is heat? Heat is the motion of atoms. So now if you go out into the hot sun, that's all it is. And you get hotter. Entropy, these ideas came from Boltzmann and Pasteur, of course, who gave us uh, not only vaccines, but also gave us the idea of structure. His famous resolution of tartaric acid is the founding, foundational pillar of biochemistry, of stereochemistry in uh, modern science. In those days, of course, science was more exciting. When Wohler produced urea from ammonium cyanate, and I'm going to come to urea in a minute because it's important in agriculture, he said, in a manner of speaking, I can no longer hold my chemical water. I must tell you that I can make urea without the use of kidneys of any animal, be it man or dog. So this was the bridge between what was called the chemistry of inorganic substances and the chemistry of biology or the chemistry of nature. Galileo a long time ago said that mathematics is the language with which God wrote the universe. Today I might paraphrase this to say, chemistry is the language with which nature wrote the book of life. Then you might ask, where did we get all this chemistry from? Remember that the natural elements, which you take for granted, were the Earth's inheritance when it was born. Nucleosynthesis is the prerogative of the stars, our sun amongst them. In his magnificent summary of the ascent of man, Jacob Bronowski, a physicist, describes this process. He talks about how atoms are built up in stars. But then he says something very important. He said, matter itself evolves. The word comes from Darwin and biology, but it is the word that changed physics in my lifetime. 
That's Pranofsky. So we must remember that the word evolution is very, very important. He describes the formation of carbon, so essential for organic chemistry, so essential for life, so for biochemistry. Carbon, for instance, is formed in a star when three helium nuclei collide at one spot within less than one millionth of a millionth of a second. Every carbon atom in every living creature has been formed by such a wildly improbable collision. What does this tell us? It tells us that life itself is a highly improbable event. Some of you might have come across Jacques Bonnot's famous book on chance and necessity of how life might actually have evolved on Earth. When I heard Dr. Mahapatra's wonderful exposition of the importance of food production, why are we producing food? We are producing food to feed an ever-increasing human population on Earth. So at some point you might give it a thought. What happens to human populations as they go on increasing? Where are the natural resources? These natural resources were our inheritance. They are not going to come again. So whatever there is on Earth is all that there is. Therefore, the field of sustainability science must in fact encompass every discipline of science, including agriculture, as it goes on into the future. But chemistry's importance is best illustrated by quoting the famous physicist Richard Feynman. In very first lecture to Caltech undergraduates, chapter one, he says, if in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? He was imagining in the 1960s the possibility of nuclear war and a nuclear winter which would follow where humanity would be wiped out and very few people would survive. That kind of cataclysm can once again be envisaged when you have a war going on in the Ukraine and with people talking irrationally about the possible use of nuclear weapons. Feynman answered his question. He says, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis or the atomic fact or whatever you may wish to call it that all things are made up of atoms. It is only this, if he says, if this one realization is there, humanity can start all the way again in building up the vast edifice of science which has come into being over the last two centuries. In the year 2000, I was the editor of Current Science. I had the task of writing an editorial every fortnight. So I used to read what other people had written. At that time, the new century was being born, the new millennium was being born, and every week, Nature had an essay, a one-page essay, in which some important commentator wrote something about science. The question asked was, what was the most important scientific advance of the 20th century? And I read this article by Václav Schmil, which has remained in my mind. He said that the world might be better off without Microsoft and CNN, and neither nuclear reactors nor space shuttles are critical to human well-being. But he said, the world's population would not have grown from 1.6 billion to today's 6 billion. That was some time ago. It's well past seven now, without the Haber-Bosch process. What is the Haber-Bosch process? Something that I read when I was in college. Today you read it even in 12th class. This is the industrial synthesis of ammonia from gaseous nitrogen and gaseous hydrogen, high temperature, high pressure. Everybody hates to study the Haber-Bosch process. Nature does it, of course, much better, and you will all worry about it as nitrogen fixation. Why is urea, uh, ammonia important? Because it led to the industrial synthesis of urea. And urea was the first fertilizer. And I heard Dr. Mahapatra in the morning talking about the many revolutions. But the first agricultural revolution of the 20th century is really the urea revolution. It is the first agricultural revolution which really eliminated famine in much of the world. Not in all parts of the world, there was still famine even in India in the 1960s, the last famine that we had, and I was a student then, and I remember it very well. 
the second agricultural revolution of the 20th century came from biology. The first came from chemistry, the second came from biology. That's, of course, the revolution which is now colored green. But today, in listening to Dr. Mahapatra, I realized that agricultural revolutions might have many other colors, including white, uh, yellow, and so forth. But Haber, who actually did the ammonia synthesis, later on also did the synthesis of Zyklon B, that is, hydro really the synthesis of hydrogen cyanide, which was used to kill many, many people during the Second World War. Chemistry's other gift to agriculture is DDT. Such a simple molecule, so wonderfully symmetrical, and with such a complicated name like dichloro, diphenyl, trichloroethane. But simple molecule works on insects. But the wonderful thing is it does it not only works on insects, it works on parasites. So in one blow, you're killing insects which are affecting crops, and you're also killing parasites which are infecting human beings. Malaria on the one hand, agriculture on the other. Within a couple of years, Muller received the Nobel Prize. But indiscriminate application of DDT, of course, led to the environmental problem. The birth of the environmental movement is this book by Rachel Carson, a nurse, appeared in 1962. I read this when I was a graduate student in America. And she says, we are rightly appalled by the genetic effects of radiation, because at that time, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still fresh in everybody's memory. How then can we be indifferent to the same effect in chemicals that we disseminate widely in our environment? Today, of course, you have the pesticides problem. Let me return to the virus. There's the virus once again. 2006, we know everything about the virus. So when SARS-CoV-2 came, we knew everything about SARS-CoV-2 by comparing it with SARS-CoV-1. The gross architecture, the gross biochemistry, all of it was pretty much the same. Very quickly, atomic level structures of the spike protein had been determined. This was by March of 2020. And a little bit later, not only were the structures of that protein determined, but the structures of that protein in complex with its receptor, the angiotensin converting enzyme, which is the surface receptor on the lung cells to which the virus binds. All of this is available. Feynman said atoms are important. Today, atomic level structures of these proteins are important in learning how to tackle the coronaviruses. But I have to ask a question here. Do viruses belong to chemistry or do they belong to biology? You will find conflicting interpretations in the literature. The virus, viruses are not a part of, are not a branch of the tree of life. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Viruses are excluded. The biologists have excluded them. There are many reasons to exclude them. They can't replicate by themselves. But then viruses can do other things. They can exchange genes across the super kingdoms of life. So today, if you look at the human genome, you will find in the imprint of your genome historical evidence for past interactions of human beings with viruses long, long ago. A small digression into biology. Nothing in biology really makes sense. De Francis said this a long time ago, except in the light of evolution. So I think one can actually only quote Darwin. In The Origin of Species, Darwin says this, there is grandeur in this view of life, that's natural selection, adaptation, and evolution. With its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. Darwin was a religious man. And that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. You can't say it better. Darwin was aware of Newton, he was aware of gravity, and he knew that the planet was cycling on and on. Planet can't do much except what it has, and from this so many biological organisms have actually evolved. I showed you the pillars of modern chemistry. What are the pillars of modern biology? There are only three. 
Two of these were erected in the 19th century, genetics by Mendel and evolution by variation and selection by Darwin. The third pillar was erected in the 20th century when Avery discovered that DNA was the pneumococcal transforming principle. That is, information for transformation was coming from DNA. In the case of the virus, it's just a small variation, it's RNA. The chemistry of heredity really was unraveled by Watson and Crick with a double helical model of DNA. Once you see the double helix, you see the chemistry of the hydrogen bonds. Uh, I was told when I was uh, outside about people coming to listen to lectures on the polymerase chain reaction. The polymerase chain reaction, of course, depends on the structure, the complementarity between the DNA strands. This is chemistry. This is the chemistry of molecular recognition by hydrogen bonds. Avery, Watson, and Crick are whom I've pictured here. The Human Genome Project afterwards has given us all the genomes. You can do comparative evolutionary genomics. You can build trees, the eukaryotic tree, and you can see that humans, chimpanzees, rats, mice, pigs, cattle, sheep, horses, and dogs are very close to one another. So sometimes when you read the newspapers of people quarreling about pigs, cattle, and so on, you actually wonder that if they had studied biology, they would have wondered about the unity of biology. And the unity of biology actually tells you that uh, even other species are interrelated. Therefore, the human species should actually be thinking of itself as one species, which normally it doesn't. The end of my presentation, towards the end, I would say, Protein sequence variation by random mutation. So we are now going to ask natural selection, variation, the chemistry of variation, what does it do to the coronavirus? What are these variants? All the variants that everybody talks about are amino acid replacements on the protein that is pictured on the right-hand side of the slide. And now I'm going to show you one paper from 1970. There's something everybody should read. It's hardly... Uh, a thousand words or even less, maybe. This is by the famous evolutionist John Maynard Smith, and he talks about natural selection and the concept of protein space. He gives a simple analogy to how proteins evolve. He says, let's take the word word, W-O-R-D. Let's change one letter, we get the word war. Let's change another letter, we get gore. Let's change one more letter, single point mutation we get gone. One more letter, we get gene. Each word has a meaning in the English language. So you can look at protein evolution. Protein has a function. Make some changes. You get another protein which has another function. The organism likes it. So protein evolution can take place in this way. All we have to ask is, what is protein space? But this library of sequences which Frances Arnold, who received the Nobel Prize for her work on bacterial evolution some time ago, evolution in the test tube, uh, calls this the library of Maynard Smith. And she compares the search for meaning in the protein universe. And when we talk about the coronavirus, we're talking about the universe of the spike protein itself. She draws attention to the small short story written by the Argentinian author Georges Louis Borges called The Library of Babel. The Library of Babel is a library in which it's filled with volumes. And if you go into that library, you will actually find the secret of the universe. But the problem is the library is so vast, so infinite, so unsearchable that anybody who goes in there to search for the meaning of the universe will probably end by dying there. That was what the point of that little short story that he wrote. But coming back to practicalities, the coronavirus spike protein is a protein which contains 1,273 amino acids. Since we have 20 genetically coded amino acids, Maynard Smith's sequence space here is 20 raised to 1,273, which, if I convert it into the powers of 10, is 10 raised to 1,656. That is one followed by 1,656 zeros. This is a very large number. 
even those of us who have now gone to being familiar with the scam numbers like 1 lakh 60,000 crores, 2 lakh 90,000 crores and so on, this number dwarfs all those numbers. So many zeros are there, it's an impossible number. How many mutations take place and at which positions? After all, a virus needs this protein to carry out its function of infection and replication. It has to bind to the receptor. It has to be cleaved by a protease, which is called furin, as a prelude to infection. And it has to fuse, the membranes have to fuse, and the virus needs to be internalized. These are depicted on the cartoon which you see on the right-hand side of the slide. The protein itself, the three-dimensional structure is pictured on the left, and I've just drawn a sort of circular representation of the sequence. Now this mutates. Now you need data. So you need sequence data on the virus. Now it turns out that the sequence data which we collected in India is, of course, uh, done by government laboratories. There was a body called INSACOG, but they are not allowed to make their sequences publicly available. So a retired scientist like myself has no access to those sequences. So we might have done 20,000, 30,000, or 40,000 sequences. But at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI, in the United States, all these sequences are made available. So the virus doesn't distinguish between Americans and Indians. And in fact, America is a better experimental model because they did not have such drastic lockdowns. So therefore, the virus spread. They also have a great deal of ethnic diversity. So it's a free population. About half the population believes in masks, the other half doesn't. Half the population believes in vaccines, the other half doesn't. So the virus has had a wonderful laboratory in which to infect the human population. And so I took the American data, and with the help of two of my colleagues, uh, uh, one of them a postdoc, and another one, another retired professor who is an expert in statistics, uh, we set out to examine these sequences. So now, for example, at one point, we had 621,518 sequences, all catalogued the day on which the sample was collected and the sequence. So you can now have a chronological evolution of sequences. In this data set, only 3,873 examples were there of the original Wuhan Chinese sequence. The virus had mutated. And it had mutated everywhere, and more and more sequences were coming, and you could do this analysis. But I'm going to show you not the analysis, because this is not a technical talk, but only to show you the alpha variant and the delta variant. Every one of you will be familiar with the delta variant, which swept through uh, from April, May, and June of 2021. I was infected in July of 2020. So I know which, even though I was not sequenced, I know which one infected me. And uh, this had only a single mutation, which is called D614G, which I will show you later. But Delta now has 10 mutations. Now we have a new variant, Omicron, which has 30 mutations. Now, of course, if you tell it the, uh, the public, uh, in fact, I would say here most scientists, including virologists, are like the public. They believe that 30 mutations are better than 10. But it's not true. As far as the virus is concerned, uh, it knows what's good for it. And uh, many mutations are irrelevant. And you need to look at them by looking at the structure of the protein and so on. So you can look at the evolution of these during the pandemic. These graphs are interesting because these graphs, when you go on the x-axis from 0 to 660, that's simply days. Day 1 is January 1, 2020. So after 360, you've gone to 2021 and so on. So you can see at the very beginning of the pandemic, the virus quickly found one mutation, one amino acid out of 1,273, an aspartic acid going to lysine, uh, to glycine, D614G. This was wonderful adaptation to the human host. Darwin would have been pleased. And that's what spread immediately. That, as it spread, it accumulated more mutations. Because the faster the virus replicates, the more mistakes it makes. And the more mistakes it makes, the more mutations it accumulates. 
those mutations get fixed. Red is the alpha, blue is the delta, and you can see in the United States this beautiful transition. I shouldn't say beautiful, but for a scientist who looks at a graph like this, it is beautiful. Uh, a wonderful Gaussian curve where the alpha goes up and comes down, and then you can see the almost perfect titration where the delta starts from zero, goes up, and then levels off. And so at one point when I made this slide, this was what happened. And there's one mutation here, proline at 681 going to arginine, which enhanced the delta variant, because this cleaves better before membrane fusion takes place. So you can study infection dynamics by doing this, but I won't worry about this. But I'm going to come right down to the present. Today, if you look at data from March of 2022, and you have to look only at, I'm sorry I look this way because I'm always used to seeing uh, the slide on the other side. Uh, the, just look at the colors. How many colors do we have here? We have purple, uh, green, uh, blue, red, black. Purple is the Wuhan virus. Green is the virus I was infected with and most people who were infected up to October, November of 2020 had only a single mutation. After that came alpha. For a short while, limited Indian data was deposited. Uh, there was one laboratory in Gujarat which did not get money from the central government. Therefore, they deposited their sequences in NCBI, and one could analyze them. And those give you the feeling that alpha was also there, delta was there, but the delta took over very quickly. You can see blue going down, red coming up. Now you see what has happened. Even the red is going down. The red has gone down and black has come up completely. Black is this Omicron mutant. You can plot with the average number of mutations and see these transitions also, but I won't worry about this. But as these transitions happen, as these mutations happen, the nature of the antibody responses change. Also, the effect of the antibodies raised by vaccine also change, and this is what leads to immune escape mutants. But one point that you must remember here is that the variant which came from Africa, the variant which came from India, and the variant which came from Europe, they're all different. And this is because I think the original virus was confronted with the immune pressure which was there in the population, native populations at that time. And therefore, some effect of human genetics on the antibody response is undoubtedly there. But I'm going to conclude very quickly by telling you how science has changed. I was supposed to reflect on science, but I'm now going to tell you how much science itself has changed. The Omicron mutant, all the mutations were reported on the 23rd of November 2021. They were not reported in a journal. They were reported on Twitter and uh, on social media, so that the information was disseminated immediately. I copied down the sequence immediately, with great difficulty because I, your aging eyesight sometimes doesn't uh, allow you to get the letters correctly. Down below I have put inside a rectangular box, just look at the green letter. The green letter will have a mutation, glutamine at 493 going to arginine. But the scientist who put this out on Twitter from South Africa had it as lysine on the 23rd of November. He had corrected it again on Twitter on the 25th of November. So two days later, he corrected the sequence. And this is, in fact, the first Omicron sequence. One comment here is important, because many of you are familiar with uh, genomes. There are three insertions, not deletions, not mu not single point mutations, but insertions. The question we may ask is, where did these three insertions come from? There is already speculation in the literature. This you can see is a speculation which has appeared on December 3rd of 2021. The sequence reported on November 23rd, the speculation appearing on December 3rd. What it says is that this has come from the human coronavirus 229E with which I began the lecture. That means somebody's been infected with the normal coronavirus, 
with this COVID-19 coronavirus variant, and then recombination has happened, and a new virus has then emerged. There are other speculations which are there in the literature that the, there is a mouse origin of the Omicron mutation. But this tells you about science. On the 27th of December 2021, less than one month after the sequence had come, a three-dimensional cryo-electron microscopy structure of this was already reported in the literature, not only comp of the protein, but complexed actually to its receptor, the soluble domain, and then to an antibody. This is, I think, the kind of progress which we cannot even imagine in the way in which science is being done in India today and the way in which science is being funded in India today. So the timescales of operation now have changed completely. I've now really come to the end. Here is something that I will just read to you because it made a great impression on me a long time ago, uh, more than 20 years ago, when I wrote something about viruses after the first SARS uh, episode. Uh, Joshua Lederberg, uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, said this. He said, human intelligence, culture, and technology have left all other plant and animal species out of the competition. We may legislate human behavior. Governments always legislate only human behavior. But we have too many illusions that we can, by writ, govern the remaining vital kingdoms, the microbes that remain our competitors of last resort for dominion of the planet. The bacteria and viruses know nothing of national sovereignties. In that natural evolutionary competition, there is no guarantee that we will find ourselves the survivor. I don't think you can say this better. He went on to say that at equilibrium, we would share the planet with our internal and external parasites, paying some tribute, perhaps sometimes deriving from them some protection against more violent aggression. Today's realization of the importance of the microbiome, for example, is uh, being anticipated here uh, by Lederberg. But he adds something. He says our propensity for technological sophistication Harness to intraspecies competition adds a further dimension of hazard. This intraspecies competition is something that one must. This is, of course, the subject of politics. Politics thrives on intraspecies competition. Biology, of course, the imperatives of biology are different. Lederberg said this. He said, as one species, we share a common vulnerability to these cultures. COVID-19 has reinforced this. No matter how selfish our motives, we can no longer be indifferent to the suffering of others. The microbe that felt one child in a distant continent yesterday can reach yours today and see the global pandemic tomorrow. Never send, he quoted the scriptures, the Christian scriptures. He said, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. The last question about the coronavirus. Where did the coronavirus come from? Was it natural evolution or was it laboratory creation? Today, molecular biology has provided us the tool to create viruses. In fact, the influenza virus which caused the 1918 pandemic has been recreated in the laboratory by synthesis. We don't know. There have been debates on the internet, in the literature, some people arguing that it's natural evolution. Virologists all argue it's natural evolution. Many others worry that it might have been a laboratory creation. But when I thought about this, I was reminded of a poem which I read a very, very long time ago, and really an 18th century poem. The poet William Blake had really looked at two animals, uh, the lamb and the tiger, and he was a good observer. He noticed that they were both looked beautiful. They both had bilateral symmetry. And he wrote one poem on the lamb and another one on the tiger. And in the poem on the tiger, he said, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? So when you look at the coronavirus, you see it's wonderfully symmetric. It's a sphere, 
the projections appear to be symmetrically arranged and you wonder how was it created. Blake, of course, went on to say, did he smile his work to see, did he who made the lamb make thee? Uh, he was, of course, religious, but you might ask whether both the tiger and the lamb were natural creations, the same question that we are asking about the coronavirus. During the pandemic, when one had time to read, one could, in principle, really struggle to try and answer this question. And the arguments of both sides sometimes appeared to be compelling. But you know, in a novel, a spy novel, and I was fond of reading them, John Le Carre said that survival is an infinite capacity for suspicion. And therefore, one must always worry. He also added in another place that a desk is a dangerous place from which to watch the world. Because I did write an article on this, uh, trying to explain this in current science. Shortly afterwards, I got a call, a telephone call, uh, from someone who said that he happened to be working for the National Security Agency. So one uh, does worry sometimes. What are the lessons from the pandemic? And all of you are biologists. Agriculture and medicine stem from the same field. Uh, nature periodically provides a reminder of the limits of human arrogance. I think that has been very clearly demonstrated. Nature also demonstrates that the frontiers of science are truly endless. We're never going to find out everything. And lastly, of course, more specifically to the subjects in which I have been trained, biology assisted by the chemistry of molecular variation is a formidable force of nature. So we must always be worried about mutations, uh, what might happen. The most important thing, of course, about mutational variation is that you can't predict them. And uh, it just happens and then is naturally selected. And this is something that most people who make policy, most people who decide on where, what science should do, this is not something that they can understand. Lastly, I must acknowledge the two institutions which have provided me shelter for much of my professional life, the Indian Institute of Science at the top left, where I spent all the active years of my career, and the National Center for Biological Sciences, which has provided me a temporary home after my retirement. Thank you very much for the great patience with this. Thank you, Professor Baram, for a really very exciting and engrossing lecture. I'm sure the audience must have enjoyed each slide of his. Uh, uh, before we move on to the next item, we have a few publications of uh, uh, NAS policy papers just which are to be released. So I request uh, our chief guest, Professor Baram, to release these publications. Uh, uh, along with our president.
policy paper number 105, sugarcane based ethanol production for sustainable fuel ethanol blending program. Something which are present mentioned. Policy paper 106 on utilization of wastewaters in urban and peri urban agriculture. Policy paper 107, certification of quality planting material of colonially propagated fruit crops uh, for promoting agriculture diversification. So <clears throat> I would like to uh, give a small token of our appreciation uh, for uh, our chief guest, Professor Balram. I request the president to uh, give it to him. Uh, now I request our president, Professor Mah uh, Trojan Mahapatra, to give his uh, remarks. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's almost, I believe, it's still good afternoon. Uh, Professor Balram, uh, Dr. A.K. Singh, Dr. Bujar Barua, Dr. Joshi, and uh, all the past uh, presidents of the academy, Dr. R.B. Singh, Dr. Punjab Singh, and uh, maybe Dr. Paroda is uh, linked online, I don't know. Uh, Dr. Kirti Singh and Dr. Gautam and all the other senior fellows of the academy, all fellows of the academy, everybody who is present here uh, today. Uh, what an intellectually satisfying lecture on uh, a topic which initially appeared, probably he will be talking uh, uh, on coronavirus uh, per se. He did talk about it, but he took us through a whole lot of uh, uh, kind of literature and uh, uh, diving deep into, uh, you know, various facets uh, of uh, uh, chemistry, biology and how chemistry, biology together uh, can actually uh, reveal the, uh, uh, the unknown uh, uh, in, in nature. Um, certainly, uh, when he said that uh, he is uh, outside from the, uh, you know, uh, not from the stream of agriculture, but from outside. You know, basically, uh, Professor Balram, uh, we actually, you know, uh, uh, always, uh, you know, choose, uh, you know, the, that way, that uh, uh, instead of listening to someone uh, who is in the uh, realm of, uh, agriculture and related subjects, uh, you know, often we think that probably uh, we would be having a different experience and exposure uh, from, uh, you know, persons like you, uh, you know, having so vast experience in the various uh, aspects uh, of uh, science. And uh, uh, the biophysics uh, and uh, uh, the area of your specialization uh, that, uh, uh, you know, you so eminently, uh, uh, you know, mastered. 
uh, you know, you go much beyond that. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, as it was said rightly, that uh, your editorial in current science, uh, you know, for a, a pretty long time that you did, uh, so effectively communicating uh, science and complicated uh, facts and issues in science in, uh, in uh, collating uh, uh, effectively with uh, various other developments and putting them together to communicate. That was something that has been something, a hallmark of your personality. And uh, today was no exception. So we thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, let's give him a big hand. And uh, as you said that, uh, you know, study of nature, as uh, Thomas uh, Askley uh, defined it, and I will not go into the details, it will take time, and you have to also cast the flight, but uh, so many things you have told us, and, uh, you know, if one goes so summarizing and uh, picking those kind of uh, points that you highlighted, uh, it will be a quite uh, a long a story, but uh, uh, I think uh, you know the the summary of it is uh, that uh, as a coronavirus, uh, you know, as a, a kind of a biological agent uh, was born, and uh, the way it has uh, spread, and the way it has uh, dis disturbed the uh, whole environment. Uh, and uh, the way you have described and placed it uh, in a perspective which is quite different, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and also intellectually, uh, you know, uh, kind of stimulating kind of uh, uh, points that you have uh, brought out so clearly. Uh, of course, uh, you highlighted the importance of uh, uh, chemistry and. Uh, uh, examples uh, you cited and then uh, in the form of secondary metabolites and uh, uh, you know uh, how these uh, complex uh, molecules and why these are produced and highlighting briefly uh, those uh, and uh, 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 coming to uh, the uh, chemistry of coronavirus, the structure, the mutation, the, the protein sequence and uh, how it changes, uh, and the, the, uh, uh, finally, uh, the, uh, mm, in describing chemistry of a coronavirus, uh, you did mention that, uh, you know, uh, the mutations which happen, and why it happened, and uh, uh, the more the mutation, a lesser mutation, and comparing them, and uh, the relevance of those, and uh, more mutation doesn't mean that it would be a more lethal. Uh, so, so evolution and adaptation you highlighted and how important it is. And uh, uh, it's not always more the mutation and greater is the adaptation. So obviously, uh, you know, where it happens and how it happens and that determines, uh, you know, uh, the adaptation so, and evolution. So uh, I mean, uh, I can go on. So, um, uh, and then, you did uh, mention about the uh, library of uh, Maynard Smith, uh, and you did mention about uh, the, uh, um, the Human Genome Project. I am going randomly, and uh, the protein variations, and uh, uh, you did uh, talk about uh, the silent spring and then the kind of philosophy thereof, uh, and uh, uh, so many other things you did talk about. Uh, uh, and uh, finally, uh, giving the lesson uh, from the pandemic. Uh, uh, certainly, the lessons uh, from the pandemic are many, but you have given three important lessons to us uh, and uh, depicted before us. And uh, uh, nature uh, certainly reminds us periodically. And this is a reminder, and a serious reminder that uh, you know it can uh, do anything and we should be conscious of it and uh, certainly uh, this reminder uh, uh, we uh, tend to forget and time to time this reminder is essential uh, second one you did mention 
that uh, frontier of science is endless. So obviously it shifts and uh, advances and at times it advances quite fast. And uh, it appears, you have rightly said, that uh, it would continue advancing and obviously in a manner which appears endless. So, so, so and we, it, it, in other words, it tells us that we have to keep striving to unravel the mystery of nature and uh, the, the coronavirus uh, mutations and uh, it would keep coming and there will be uh, newer reminders coming to us in different forms, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, we are caught on our way, uh, you know, this time and also we might be caught on way in future. Uh, but uh, the science that we did and that we would be doing, obviously it would advance the frontier, but uh, as you said, uh, it would be endless. And uh, uh, because the new uh, editions uh, of uh, such events would be coming, and those new editions would be quite perplexing and might be far more complex than what was offered by coronavirus, uh, whether you explain in terms of chemistry or molecular biology, or you explain uh, in a historical perspective or philosophical perspective, and you have put uh, in various formats uh, getting quotes from various, uh, you know, kind of philosophical uh, philosophers or, or even scientists. So that would continue, and that exploration of minds would continue, uh, and the mind would keep exploring those uh, new frontiers, and obviously it would be advancing. And of course, biology and chemistry, uh, you know, uh, uh, as you said rightly, uh, uh, it's a very formidable combination and uh, 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 understanding uh, biology would require chemistry and chemistry, biology together certainly would help us explore new horizons and uh, have uh, newer frontiers, uh, 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 you know, uh, discovered. Uh, the nature, understanding nature uh, would certainly require, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, formidable combination of uh, you know, biology and chemistry, and uh, certainly other, other aspects of uh, uh, science should be equally important. Uh, as you said, that you had association with a statistician uh, to, uh, you know, understand uh, uh, the virus, uh, the mutations, and the way things are happening. And uh, that computational aspect should, uh, has become important and would be, uh, uh, you know, in years to come, uh, far more important uh, to understand biology. So the, the mathematics and computation part of biology uh, would be uh, equally important. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you did, uh, you know, quote uh, uh, um, uh, Feynman's, uh, uh, you know, uh, some aspects of his uh, saying uh, and what he said, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, lectures in, uh, you know, physics and, uh, you know, living, uh, and what is actually life, that's what uh, was defined by Schrodinger. Uh, and uh, when we talk about nature and living system and uh, uh, you know, how uh, to understand that, so obviously the chemistry uh, is a weapon, it's a, it's a strength, uh, but at the same time uh, the other aspects, the physical aspects of life is equally important, uh, the computational aspect is also important, and chemistry, physics, computation, and I mean mathematics, and together uh, would help us unravel the nature, and the biology would be uh, far more fascinating in years to come. You know, unfortunately in this country, we separate mathematics from biology, though chemistry, physics, uh, and even physics uh, get separated early uh, from biology. Uh, but the mystery of nature and biology uh, uh, cannot be understood and explored uh, without the help of physics and then, uh, you know, mathematics and the computational aspects of it, uh, uh, as we see it. And the coronavirus has taught us this. And uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, your message uh, of, uh, you know, uh, understanding this pandemic, the, you know, today the every common man understands and speaks about the language, uh, you know, RT-PCR, it's so common today. 
corona virus everybody understands corona and the virus what it is although they don't go into it what it is a living or dead or whatever on the, the the interface of it but everybody the common man talks about it so these uh, key words uh, of uh, biology has gone into uh, the uh, you know uh, thinking uh, of common man uh, and uh, today uh, you know uh, this uh, audience uh, certainly uh, you know, uh, are biologists, and not all of them, of course, uh, you know, but then uh, almost all uh, are familiar with biology. But uh, the way uh, you have uh, explained uh, coronavirus, collecting many other things and bringing philosophy uh, at times, uh, and uh, there's no time to go into, this, uh, you know, details of what you explain. But, uh, you know, uh, if I have captured correctly what you said, uh, you know, or, you know, in a very intellectually stimulating manner, and uh, uh, collating many, many things from. Uh, uh, it's typical of you because you read so many things, uh, so bring everything together and explain in a different format. That's what we saw in this context of today's lecture, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed. And there are lessons for all of us, and certainly, uh, you know, uh, we would remember. The Academy would remember for a long time uh, your uh, fascinating talk, exciting and stimulating talk that you delivered today, Professor Balram. So thank you very much uh, for agreeing to our request to be uh, here today on the Foundation Day uh, of the Academy. And uh, uh, certainly uh, we would be interacting uh, with you, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in the future as well, and I'm sure uh, you would uh, 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 not hesitate to, uh, you know, uh, again uh, come back uh, on uh, different occasions. So uh, uh, time is limiting. So thank you very much once again. Let's give him a very big hand. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so friends, I have a very pleasant responsibility to extend a vote of thanks to all those who made this session uh, very, very successful. At the outset, uh, sir, I would, on behalf of the academy and on my own behalf, we profusely thank you, uh, our chief guest, Professor P. Balramji, for accepting our uh, invitation and delivering an exciting and excellent uh, Foundation Day lecture. Uh, <clears throat> the lecture on reflections on science in age of coronavirus, uh, full of evidence and rich of information. Uh, sir, it was a brilliant history of coronavirus connecting biology and chemistry. Uh, you, in fact, deciphered very puzzles of coronavirus in a very, very simple language. Uh, all of us could have heard this sophisticated topic in a very, very simple language. At least as economists, I could also understand the way you are speaking on this particular topic. Uh, friends, there is a saying that the fragrance of the flowers flow in the direction of wind. But your research, sir, research contribution, your wisdom, and your goodness spreads in all the directions. So we benefited a lot from your outstanding talk. I will also request all of you to please give a big hand again uh, to him for such a brilliant lecture. Sir, thank you very much for a very brilliant and thought-provoking lecture to all of us. Uh, your lecture will be uploaded in our website so that all others, those who could not attend this, can uh, listen. I uh, thank our president, Dr. T. Mahapatra, for his inspiring remarks. Thank you, sir, for providing your continuous guidance and great leadership to take the academy to newer heights. Thank you so much. I thank uh, both the vice presidents, Dr. A.K. Singh and Dr. Bajat Burwa, 
for their continued support and guidance in making these programs uh, very, very successful. Uh, friends, we are so lucky that we have our past presidents with us and very, very senior fellows. I always say they are uh, grand fellows and great grand fellows. They are with us and we are so lucky. Your presence is really inspiring and motivating to all of us, especially to younger generation, to see all of you, those have heard of your names. Uh, thanks to all the office bearers and executive council for, you know, for approving the name of Professor Balram. So all, all the executive members are here. And thanks to all the fellowship who attended this lecture in person as well as uh, online. There are many. I can see Dr. Ratan Lal is also there online. It must be midnight there in the United States of America. Dr. Gajendra Singh is also there from the United States of America. So people are listening this address all over the world. And thanks to all the uh, fellowships. And I can see many of our deputy director generals, directors of ICR institutes, vice chancellors. So thank you for joining uh, this wonderful occasion uh, with us. Last but not least, I profusely thank our secretariat for ex exemplary work they have done to make this uh, session very, very successful. Thank you very much. We'll break for tea uh, and then reassemble at 4.30 for interaction sessions with our past presidents and uh, Professor Ratan Lal is also there on, online. So 4.30 we will reassemble. <laughs>